Namaste. So you might think that, well, what is there to know about emptiness? <laughs> I mean, how much can I say about emptiness, right? Well, it's like name and form. I looked up on the suttas, all the suttas having to do with emptiness, and there's maybe a thousand of them. So <laughs> emptiness is actually a very important topic, and we haven't even started to cover it from the Vedic side. So emptiness is a big deal. Why is it such a big deal? There's nothing to it. <laughs> but the point is, when we attain the realization of emptiness, that stops the creation of Sankara. So the Buddha created a gradual series of meditations called the jhanas. They're more and more subtle. And finally, leading to complete emptiness. So, is that Nibbana? No. Listen to this. Since Nibbana is called the stilling of all preparations, Sankara, Sabha Sankara Samata, one might sometimes conclude that the attainment of the cessation of perceptions and feeling, Sanya Veda Nitya Niroda, is itself Nibbana. But it is upon rising from that attainment, which is like a deep freeze, that one makes contact with the three deliverances, the signless, animita, the desireless, apanihita, and the void, sunyata. So Bhikkhu Nyanananda, no less an authority than he, says that actually emptiness is not Nibbana. How could it be? Because emptiness, or focusing on emptiness, or residing in emptiness, or dwelling in emptiness, is conditional. What happens when you reach emptiness? Is that the whole world shows up in it. See, there's just something about emptiness that's so creative. It becomes like a mirror that reflects the entire creation. So emptiness is really a powerful state. It's, it's a state with great potential. You know, it's like you have a, a, a pendulum with a heavy weight hanging by a chain, let's say. Huh? like a wrecking ball, a really heavy weight. And you push that weight all the way to one side. It takes a tremendous effort. But then what happens when you let go? It swings to the other side. Isn't it? So emptiness is an extreme. We never encounter emptiness directly in our ordinary everyday experience. Why? Because it's an extreme. It's such an extreme that if you can attain it, even for a second, when you come out of it, everything is different. It has such transformative power. So you see, emptiness I, I kind of cheated a little bit on the last video. I called it the goal. Well, it's not exactly the goal. It's the gateway to the goal. If you can pass through that gateway, then Nibbana is yours. Automatically, without any further effort. 
Why? Because when you come out of that state of complete emptiness, you can see the phoniness of things. That's why he says the signless deliverance. The signless means one does not take things at face value anymore. But one can understand that everything, thing <laughs> that exists, that has being, is a result of sankara, is a result of making, of compounding, cause and effect. So there's nothing natural about it. It happens as a byproduct of our trying to attain uh, individual existence. So coming out of emptiness, we can see this. It's very clear. Everything is phony. Everything is bullshit. <laughs> you think the news is phony? Huh. Even the person giving the news is phony. <laughs> Everything is phony. Everything is sankata, compounded, fabricated, made, constructed, built, caused. And because it's caused, because it's the effect of a cause, as soon as the cause changes, the effect also changes. So everything is impermanent. We don't believe in its absolute existence. That is the signless deliverance. Then, because these things are basically worthless, <laughs> we don't desire them anymore. We see that, you know, it's only a paper moon hanging over a cardboard sea. And it's, it is make-believe. Whether we believe in it or not, it's still phony. So what is the only real thing? Emptiness, nothingness, Nibbana, the uncaused. And finally, the void. We see that all these phenomena are actually void. What does that mean? They have no intrinsic beingness. They are simply an appearance in awareness, a mirage. And if we look into the mirage, we can see the whole physics behind it and realize that, oh, this is phony. It's like the magic show. Huh? <laughs> he likes to talk about a magic show, the mind as a magic trick. Now, everybody knows on some level when a magician does a trick that it's phony, right? There really isn't a rabbit sitting in his hat. The rabbit is someplace else and it just appears to come from the hat. Or whatever the trick the guy does. Huh? So, because it's phony, the game is, the guessing game is, well, how did he do it? And that's actually the attraction of the magic show. Like, how did he, how did he do that? How, how did he guess that card? <laughs> well, he didn't guess it. The whole thing was a setup. And in the same way, this reality is so-called reality. <laughs> that we live in is a setup. And if we buy into it, if we believe in it, if we think that it's real, then we're a sucker and we get trapped. We get exploited. Our whole existence is taken away from us by engaging in different useless pursuits. And people profit from that. Businesses profit from that. That's how they make their living. 
exploitative. So we don't buy it. We don't accept it. We think it's all void, sunyata. That doesn't mean that we think that we're nihilists. Nihilists say that there is nothing. No, there is something. Huh? When we see a mirage in the desert, it's a real mirage. <laughs> but it pretends to be something that is not. That's why it's a mirage. So in the same way, this world pretends to be real. It pretends to be permanent. It pretends to have actual substance, actual meaning. But really, it doesn't. It's just a comedy. So one who sees this sees that the real reality is emptiness, nothingness. Uh, here's a verse spoken by the Buddha. Hard to see is the endless. It's not easy to see the truth. Pierced through is craving and nothing for him who knows and sees. So all these objects that we are led to desire and crave are actually nothing. Well, they're real. Yeah, they're real mirages. <laughs> like this body. Huh? This body comes into existence in a very painful way. And then it exists with lots of suffering and disappointment for a limited length of time. And then it dwindles and degenerates and disappears. And that's life. Huh? And yet we, we guard this life so jealously. We're so attached to it. Huh? But it's not endless. It has an end. Anything that has an end is suffering. Because as soon as we get attached to it, when it changes and disappears, then we suffer. So try to understand. Detachment, huh? Piercing through craving. Seeing that the objects that we crave are but illusions. That means those who know and see realize that this world is nothing. The world beyond is the real world. How do we attain that? Listen again to the Buddha. Consciousness which makes nothing manifest, infinite and all lustrous, does not partake of the earthiness of earth, the wateriness of water, the fieriness of fire, the airiness of air, the creaturehood of creatures, the devahood of devas, the brahmahood of brahma, the radiance of the radiant ones, the overlordship of the overlord, Ishwara, or the allness of the all. Now this is unconditioned awareness. Although he calls it consciousness here, sanya. It's not really consciousness. It's something more than consciousness. It's consciousness which has no quality, which has no object, is unconditioned. Because consciousness becomes conditioned by its object. It's like a mirror. If you put something red in front of a mirror, the mirror turns red. The same with any other color. So the mirror becomes conditioned by whatever you place in front of it. The same with awareness. But once awareness disengages from all its objects, it becomes unconditioned. This isn't consciousness anymore. Or awareness which is only aware of itself. This is objectless awareness because the so-called object is actually the subject. <laughs> if you meditate on this, you will become very blissful. <laughs> 
Oh, and by the way, notice that in this uh, verse, the Buddha mentions both Brahma and Shiva, Ishwar. This is another proof that actually the Buddha's philosophy is based on the Vedic culture, the Vedic scriptures. But it's a reinterpretation, a reimagining, huh? a new expression or a new formulation using negative logic. And then there's one more verse I want to share with you out of the thousands that, <laughs> that I found pertaining to emptiness. Then there is the case where a monk, with the complete transcending of the dimension of neither perception nor non-perception, enters and remains in the cessation of perception and feeling. And having seen that with discernment, his sankhara are completely ended. Even this much is described by the Blessed One as the attaining of an opening in a confining space without a sequel. What does this mean? Emptiness is the ultimate escape. People are trying to escape through sense enjoyment, through drugs, various forms of intoxication, uh, various forms of material welfare, political schemes, so many different plans. People are trying to escape. Well, what are they trying to escape? Suffering. So, in the sutta from which this verse comes, the Buddha lays out a gradually ascending progression of escapes. That each one is an opening from a confined space, leading to a condition of less suffering. But there's always a sequel. There's always another escape because that space becomes also too confining. But once one reaches the complete cessation of perception and feeling, well, that's nothingness, that's emptiness. Then the sankhara are completely ended. There's no more being and becoming. And because of that, there's no more suffering. Try to understand this. It's not that emptiness is the final goal, but it's the gateway through which one must pass to reach the final goal, which is indescribable, uh, ineffable, non-conceptual, transcendent nibbana. Om Tat Sat. Buddha Sarnai.